The first suburbs emerged in response to the deplorable conditions of cities at the end of the 19th century. In 1878, New York journalists commented on how the city center only housed the very rich and very pow. While the middle classes lived in the suburbs, a phenomenon that still exists today. The growing belief in the upper middle class that cities were becoming uncivil and barbaric, and that society needed to return to traditional country living, fueled the demand for this. But while streetcar suburbs were growing out of major cities across the world, an ordinary, completely unknown London stenographer named Ebenezer Howard was formulating his idea for a utopian suburban experiment, the Garden City. But why was Ebenezer Howard's suburban dream so different from those of existed before? He viewed Garden City as a golden key to solving society's problems for the rich and the poor. This was because he and many others thought overcrowded cities were one of, if not the biggest, cause of social issues. Many of the utopian planners from the century, including Ebenezer Howard, made cooperative ownership of land an essential component of their projects. He laid out his ideas, and the only book he ever published in 1898, titled Tomorrow. The Garden City was limited in size, pre-planned, self-supporting, democratically run, and set in an agricultural estate on community-owned land. He portrayed big cities as a magnet attracting people from the countryside with the promise of work, services, and opportunity. So, he wanted to create a third magnet, the Garden City, that offered residents all the benefits of city's proximity to a lot of people, access to large institutions, etc., but without any of the downsides. It would allow them to live closer to nature in a more equitable system through cooperative ownership. His model Garden City had a giant park at the center surrounded by a boulevard in most of the savings government buildings. This road was surrounded by another park and a large gloss enclosed winter garden and shopping market he called the Crystal Palace on a massive 420-foot-wide Grand Avenue with other institutions like schools and churches in it. The city would be subdivided by large radial tree-lined boulevards into distinct quarters that could be built separately. This would be a mixed architectural style and size, ranging from detached single-family homes to apartments with some cooperative gardens or kitchens. There would be space for all social classes. The residents of Garden City will join construction societies in cooperatives that would manage their neighborhoods. About a 15-minute walk from the city center, you would find the Green Belt. The Green Belt was meant to be a permanent growth boundary that would surround each guarded city. The space would be reserved for factories, farmland, and parks, allowing residents to work local jobs. A railroad line through the Green Belt would connect residents to the old metropolis or other garden cities. Once a single city reached a certain population, construction would leap over the Green Belt and begin building an entirely different city, keeping population density low and leaving large amounts of green space between urban areas. These groups of several garden cities formed the social city where residents could travel between them to access institutions like universities or hospitals that served a larger population than a single community. With this network of garden cities, Ebenezer Howard saw a way to get all the benefits of the city while connecting us to nature and eliminating poverty. Only five years after his book's publication, the first real attempt at creating a garden city was started. It would be called Letchworth. Aside from the two official garden cities in England, Letchworth and Wellin, which involved Howard, others had been popping up all over the world. In 1913, Ebenezer Howard anticipated the peak of his garden city movement in the Pacific. However, the garden city movement in Australia was not quite realized. Nonetheless, it has been recognized to shape the living environments of Australians. Up until 1901, the Commonwealth government was more concerned about defense and trade, working towards world capitalism, neglecting planning and housing importance. In the 19th century, Australian cities were private cities as every city worked individually with financiers, speculators, and landlords. Hence the government had no vision to improve the cities of Australia. Large-scale urban is a tie-in without concrete plans, and limited development in housing meant that social problems were common. From this problem arose ideas for urban reformism, 
making it vital in implementing the Garden City ideas as Australia moved towards a significant social reform in 1890-1914, achieving humanistic liberalism. The introduction of the Garden City movement in Australia meant the potential solution to improve living conditions by incorporating the overhauling of outmoded practices of land subdivision, the greening of residential neighborhoods, parklands with playgrounds, land zoning, and housing improvement. A successful garden suburb in Australia is the Colonel Lights Gardens in South Australia, Mitcham City, with a population of 5,041. In June 1915, the land was purchased by the Vaughan Labor government in Mitcham, South Australia. The government wanted to establish a model garden suburb after being inspired by Charles Redd's Australasian Town Planning Tour lecture in 1914. Charles Redd was a town planner from New Zealand who advocated the Garden City movement overseas in public lectures and was heavily inspired by the Garden City movement scheme of improving the lifestyle and environment of all classes. In 1916, he was employed as South Australia's first government town planner and designed a scheme, Mitcham Garden Suburb. In 1917, his plans were presented at the first town planning and housing conference exhibition in Adelaide. In 1919, it was ratified by the state government when the Garden Suburb Act was passed, making the whole planning process heavily regulated by the local government with which they had influence over. As the construction was ongoing in 1920s, Colonel Light's Gardens was advertised to the public providing a sales brochure to encourage people to buy the property. The suburb emphasized the benefits and services that the suburb would provide. The model garden suburb offered residents comfort, convenience, and beauty, with amenities included, such as gas, electricity, water and sewerage, surfaced roads, public transport, and vistas of the surrounding area, which made the garden suburb attractive to live in. In June 1924, the Labour government planned to accelerate the development of the model garden suburb and implemented a mass housing scheme, also known as the Thousand Home Scheme, which was administered in order to boost the sales of the garden suburb. This was built on a large portion of undeveloped lands in Colonel Light Gardens. To accommodate the scheme for more houses, remodeling was constant within the suburb, and farmlands were purchased to expand it. This scheme brought about division and minor conflict with the residents on the northern end, areas which were built first and southwest of the suburb, areas on which the Thousand Homes scheme was established on. This is because the northern end of the suburb was concerned about the discrepancy in the value between the old and the new properties. Additionally, they believed that the Thousand Homes scheme would mar the value of the original properties. Older residents were also concerned that the Thousand Home Scheme would bring about slum conditions. The original design by Charles Redd involved the principles of the Garden City Movement, incorporating mixed use of recreational places and allotments for the community. However, the Thousand Home Scheme established by the government in 1924 changed the original plan, thus requiring the remodeling of the majority of the original plan. The suburb was originally designed by Charles Redd in 1917 based on his experience of the Garden City movement, but he left the project to surveyor Charles Davenport Harris in 1920, who refined the design. Originally, Charles Redd focused on a comprehensive statewide known town planning and legislation, which was achieved when the Garden Act was passed in late 1920, in order to get support for the funding and government. This meant that the garden suburb could be managed by commissioners, having similarities to the Heritage Foundation in Letchworth Garden City. How Colonel Light Gardens was managed was a very strong example of the Garden City suburb principles. The intention for this garden suburb was to act as a model for future suburbs, as Australia was starting to progress in its town and urban planning. It followed most of Garden City's principles in that. The housing was affordable but offered both urban and rural benefits. The Garden Suburb Act was managed by commissioners, which was similar to the Heritage Foundation in Letchworth Garden City. Distinct areas were planned accordingly to provide commercial, shopping, medical institutes, administrative, educational, religious, recreational, and residential and uses. 
Industrial areas were far from the suburbs. Additionally, land zoning gave residents the space to produce their own food. Land use zoning was effectively implemented for designated use in order to create a safer environment for everyone as well as to avoid congestion. One of the main garden suburb principles was to provide adequate sites to be allocated for parklands, playgrounds, and flower plots, in which kernel-like gardens were successful, encouraging social interaction. The suburb was successful in maintaining its natural conservation in that red retained the existing flora, which was implemented in the plan, creating wide tree-lined streets and reservations for parklands. Red strictly adhered to a park-like effect throughout the suburb, maintaining the growth of vegetation trees in linearity. This was to preserve the appearance of the street, creating a utopia in the suburb. Additionally, a radial plan was used to reach optimum levels of pedestrian and vehicular safety implementing rounded street corners and radiating plan that enabled efficient vehicular circulation. The garden suburb promoted equality in that it was intended to provide houses with equal allotments in groups throughout the suburb to avoid segregations between the residents according to their class. Internal reserves were emphasized in the plan, and open spaces for each allotment were significant. There were three tiers of open space. Internal reserves were placed behind the smallest sized housing allotments and were used as community open spaces. This proved to be innovative and practical. This idea was only implemented in the allotments that were built before the Thousand Home Schemes, changing the intention. Houses were built away from the front boundary to enable space for vegetation, achieving private and public gardens, thus having a park-like environment for each allotment. Even single dwellings gave ample yard space. Red conceptualized the idea that the Australian approach to the one-family house should be maintained, enforcing strict limitations on the number of homes in one hectare. Residential buildings were set back from the street in order to emphasize building alignment. Houses were of different designs, and Red promoted harmony and uniformity as he was concerned with the identity of individual homes. This gave the residents to be more expressive of their identity through their homes, allowing freedom within the constraints of garden suburb principles. Californian bungalows and later on Neo-Tudor houses were constructed. Upon the pursuit of the Thousand Home schemes, houses had 14 different designs from which the buyers had to choose. However, homes of the same design were prohibited to be designed next to each other. Colonel Light Gardens has maintained its original form ever since the 1920s. However, there were a few changes that were made to build more houses, for instance, creating more subdivisions to accommodate more houses in 19601970. Unused shopping sites were used for the expansion of housing. In the 1980s, the local community was aware of the significance of the garden suburb, leading organizations' governments to fund Colonel Light Gardens' conservation study to recognize its significance in national and planning history. Thus, the garden suburb was included in the register of the National Estate in 1999 and declared a state heritage area in 2000. The Garden City movement in the United States of America flourished in the 1920s as American urban planners were trying to establish concrete visions for urban planning. In 1923, the Regional Planning Association of America was formed. This association was pivotal in building America's urban planning as they were active advocates of the Garden City movement. They consisted of experts of like-minded professionals. It had notable members like Clarence Stein, who was behind the group, as well as Lewis Mumford. The association was sponsored by the City Housing Corporation, making some of America's garden cities come to plan. In 1927, the National Conference on City Planning NCCP recognized the problem in urbanity, encompassing traffic congestion, street safety, alleviating crowded living and working conditions, and livability for city dwellers. The aim was to provide a favorable city environment that meant reducing waste, regulating the scale of the cities, and incorporating a combination of new, modern, and appropriate beauty within the American ideals of efficiency. The United States of America has always been adapting and cities, but a domestic city planning movement only emerged in the early 20th century.
Radburn is located in New Jersey, United States of America. The plan for Radburn was inspired by Letchworth, Hampstead, and Welland Garden Cities. The concept of Radburn began when Americans were trying to find a solid foundation for the profession of urban town planning, hence establishing urban planning and housing committees. It was constructed with the sponsorship of the City Housing Corporation. The master planners for Radburn were Clarence Stein and Henry Wright working with Alexander Bing's Housing Corporation. Radburn adhered to the principles of Howard's Garden City. It was intended to be self-sufficient and aimed to house a 30,000 population. Lands were zoned accordingly, housing residentials, commercial and industrial areas, which was to provide for the needs of the neighborhood. It was to supply municipal services such as recreation and daycare activities for families. The layout of the community introduced the super block concept, incorporating a cul-de-sac, interior parklands, and the separation of vehicles from pedestrians to make a safe environment. Radburn was a hybrid of Garden City, dubbed as the town of the motor age, labeled as the first scientific innovation in community towns designed to eliminate automobile accidents. Even so, it still achieved a high level of aesthetic with its well-planned out parklands. It was also vital to connect to nature amidst the advancement of the modern city. Additionally, it provided amenities of open space, community services, and economic advancement. It sought to be decentralized, self-contained, considered environmental importance, and open space while harnessing the automobile evolution as well as promoting community life. The plan for houses worked around the idea to separate pedestrians and vehicles by using residential superblocks, incorporating short rear entry cul-de-sacs and internal spines of open space. Every block of houses had a back-to-front typology. The housing orientation was designed so that it was facing the park areas, giving easy access to parking walks. The architectural style for Redburn was Colonial Revival and Tudor Revival. The housing following a super block farm was designed for high-density, clustering of single, double, and multi-family housing around large areas of parkland. The plan for housing was organized around vehicular traffic, with the road designed hierarchically, supposedly creating a safer environment for pedestrians. Each house block was closer to the street, but the rear of the houses formed a system of pedestrian pathways which enabled pedestrians to walk throughout the block without crossing the road. This was an interior park and pathway system that supposedly encouraged interaction with the neighbor and aimed to improve community values. In the midst of Rapburn's construction, the architectural press hailed it a success. However, in 1929, the Great Depression halted development, which only resulted in only one quarter of the design being developed. This affected the City Housing Corporation as it went bankrupt, preventing the full development of Radburn. Because of this, a number of lands that were meant to be developed for Radburn were sold off, of which sprung industrial buildings. The plan for Radburn was comprehensive and involved numerous multidisciplinary syntheses from experts working collaboratively to achieve effective planning. Radburn, despite being incomplete, gained momentum as it was the mark of progressive reform in town planning. It was the most influential town planning in the cities in North America, making it an influential precedent. It remains today as a laboratory for urban planning experiments recognized as the first tangible evidence of science and architecture aimed to improve man's habitation in the midst of industrial advancement, because the plan for Radburn fulfilled healthy requirements. In 2005, it was declared a National Historic Landmark. The Garden City movement was a breakthrough in many cities around the world. It broke apart social class division, promoting harmony and equality in living conditions and housing. It was the tangible evidence of the radical social reformation that took place in the early 20th century. Nonetheless, in the processes of construction, the government perceived the Garden City movement to be a vessel to drive further economic advancement that pursued global capitalism despite its good intentions. However, Ebenezer Howard's plan, although most of it incomplete and strayed away from its principles, was still seen as a success. It is a fertile laboratory for the built environment professionals seeking to improve the conditions of urbanity.